Hi everybody, my name is Benjamin. I'm working for Microsoft as the CTO in residence of Microsoft Accelerator in Paris. So basically my job is to help startups to go on the cloud uh, on Microsoft Azure, obviously, and I'm helping hundreds of startups per year uh, to onboard on Azure. So we have to agree on several principles before going forward. First of all, uh, the fact that we are switching, switching from monolithic application to a loosely coupled components. This is the first one. The second one is the fact that we are moving all the logic, all the uh, intelligence of an application from the client uh, to uh, servers, to the cloud. And uh, the third one, which is related to the first, uh, is the fact that we add complex framework and we now tend to have more and more uh, microservices. Okay, we all agree on that. Uh, th there are several technical solutions to these uh, shifts. First is containers. Uh, containers, Docker, Kubernetes, and so on. Another one is serverless. This is, uh, this is why I'm going to talk about today. So what is serverless? First of all, this is not uh, a technology without any server. Uh, we are in the cloud, there are server. Uh, yes, this is, uh, this is funny, but I have to say it. Um, the, we are calling that serverless because we don't have to manage server. As a developer, as an ops, you don't have to, uh, to, carry, um, to, care, so, sorry, to care about the servers, you don't have to manage them, you don't have to back up them, you don't have to set up them, and so on and so on. Secondly, uh, when you have a serverless service, it has to scale uh, every time it needs to scale without any action on your part. Uh, for example, if you have uh, one service which has to be called once a day, it has to be exactly the same service without any action to be able to, uh, to be executed 100 uh, times per second if you need that. Okay, so. 100% transparent, and it has to scale for you. And the third characteristic of a serverless service is uh, sub-second billing. Uh, we are in the cloud, so uh, obviously you pay only for what you need, but if you, if you, have, if you need only a few milliseconds for uh, one execution of your code, for example, you will pay only for these milliseconds. You won't pay uh, for the server uh, for one month, for example. Okay, so the granularity is very, very small. Okay, so that, that was serverless. Now let's talk about Azure and Azure function, which is one example of a serverless solution. So first of all, uh, a big picture of Azure very quickly. These are the server, so this is serverless on servers. Uh, then we have infrastructure services on Azure. Basically, you, you, can, uh, um, you can instantiate virtual machines. You choose one uh, operating system. You want uh, this, this distribution of Linux. You want a Windows server. You want whatever. You install, you set up all uh, your servers, your stacks, uh, all the components of your application, and you manage them. So this is infrastructure as a service services. Then. Uh, on top of that, you have platform as a service where you push the code to the cloud provider, to Azure here, and uh, you, you put some configuration uh, settings. For example, you want uh, this version of Python, uh, you want this application settings, this environment variable, and you push that to the cloud provider, and the cloud provider run the code for you. Okay, we're going to talk more about Azure function in a minute. But we, are, we have a third type of service in Azure, uh, which we can call turnkey managed services. For example, if you want uh, a SQL uh, database or a NoSQL database, if you want um, uh, Hadoop, but a, a Hadoop cluster without managing the, the cluster yourself, or if you want cognitive services, computer vision, text analytics services, all this kind of stuff, but you don't want to set up anything, and pushing any code, you can use that as a fully managed service on Azure. So your application is here. It can sit on top of infrastructure services, on top of platform as a service, or both, uh, and it can use or not uh, managed services. 
in this list, we have a few serverless uh, examples. Uh, Azure Function is one of them, but some other uh, managed services are serverless. We're going to talk more today about Azure Function. So the basics of Azure Function is the fact that it combines code that you want to execute and events uh, that's going to trigger your code. So because we have uh, a very big marketing team at Microsoft, as you may know, uh, they had an idea for logo, and this is it. Boom. I, I want to do it again. Okay, so this is Azure Function, code plus events. I won't do a live demo today because we don't have a lot of time, but I have done some screenshots this morning. Uh, this is the Azure portal. So this is a graphical user interface of Azure. Obviously, everything can be done uh, by code and everything can be, can be automated. We have a, a CLI which is built in Python, by the way. Uh, so this is the, the, the main portal. I can create what we call a function app in order to, to store all my functions definition. And when you have a function app, you can open this part of the portal where you can see on the left the list of your functions and you can do a lot of stuff on the right. So first of all, I'm going to, to describe you how to create a new function. The first step is to choose uh, the stack you want to use. Obviously, it, it will be Python today. Uh, to, to, be, to be honest, Python is uh, still experimental on Azure function today, but we, are, uh, we need your, your feedback in order to improve the service. Uh, for your information, JavaScript and C Sharp are the two which are uh, the most uh, mature today. Then uh, you have the languages, the stack, and then uh, you have uh, a lot of templates that you can use to um, not begin from scratch, but with some, some uh, example you can customize instead of doing from scratch. So here I have the, the Azure function Hello World. Uh, where I have some Python code to get an HTTP request and to display uh, a message. But no, nothing complex here. Uh, I can run it with the run button uh, on the top, and then you can see the result here. I'm sorry, it's a little bit small. Hello world from uh, Python function app. You have the logs on, on the bottom, and you have the test configuration on the right. Okay, this is cool. Uh, this is Azure function in the Azure uh, graphical user interface in the portal. But obviously, uh, this is an HTTP request. You can call that from everywhere, everywhere you have an HTTP stack. Uh, you can just copy the URL and open, for example, Postman to test that everything is working well from the outside world. And uh, let's say that you want to customize a request with Py PyParis uh, 2017 and then you will get the result, uh, which is a Hello World customized for your request. Okay, so this is a very, very simple function app. Uh, you have to, to know uh, one main concept uh, if you want to go further. First of all, uh, well, this main concept is the concept of binding. Uh, we have three types of binding, triggers, inputs, and outputs. So as the name implies, triggers mean that uh, you, you are going to configure something to trigger your function, so to trigger the execution of your code. Uh, in, in my first exam example, the hello world, uh, this is an HTTP trigger. Every time you receive an HTTP request, you execute a code. Uh, but you can have other types of trigger, a timer. For example, every five seconds you run your code, uh, every uh, uh, Tuesday, uh, when Tuesday uh, is uh, uh, the fifth of the, of the month, you can use that, you can configure that with uh, a cron, uh, the cron syntax. You can have other type of triggers, for example, every time you receive uh, a message in a queue, uh, we have a queue technology which, which is called Azure Queue Storage. But we can imagine to receive, uh, to receive messages from other technologies, uh, we talked about uh, Celery a few minutes uh, uh, before for the, for the PDF talk. Uh, you can imagine to have, to have a trigger. Each time you have a new message in a Celery queue, uh, your code will be triggered and executed. Okay, and then this is the first concept, trigger, the first type of binding. But there is another one which is in the middle, which is in input binding. 
Uh, this this uh, binding is uh, simple. Uh, every time you, your code is triggered, it can go search somewhere if you have some data to consume. Uh, when you have an HTTP request as a trigger, uh, the data can be in the request. But when your trigger is a timer, you need to go uh, to look for the data somewhere else. Then you can configure here, uh, going to, uh, to look in a FTP server for a new data, or, or going to, to look in a database, and so on and so on. So the goal of uh, input binding is not to have to develop yourself, to code yourself, all the, the code needed to connect to the database, to, uh, to share the credentials, uh, to, to use retry pattern if you want to, to retry when it fails, and so on and so on. This has been developed in open source uh, as a binding. Okay, the last concept is outputs. Uh, on the right, you can output a result in HTTP. Uh, in the HTTP response, as I done in the hello world, but obviously you can store the results elsewhere. You can uh, write a new file, you can uh, write uh, as a JSON object in a MongoDB uh, database, you can do whatever you want, and if you don't want to write the code for that, you use an output binding uh, in order to use the code already written for you. Is that clear? So I, I've shown you how to do that in the portal with uh, wizards, uh, but obviously you can configure everything with code, well actually with uh, JSON files. Uh, this is a file to configure all the bindings, the trigger, the inputs, the outputs. And because these are only files, you can store them in your source control and then deploy them from uh, Git, for example. This is the same story for, for the code. I show you the code in the graphical interface. You will use that for uh, development purpose, but you, don't, you won't do that in production. Obviously, obviously, you're going to deploy all the files needed uh, through, through Git, uh, or with um, continuous integration with GitHub, and so on. So you can configure that. Uh, this is the list of provider we have uh, by default, but because you have plain Git, you can do whatever you want. And this is one example of uh, a lot of features that you can have on top of just executing your code. If you want to use a custom domain, you can. If you want to have uh, staging slots to test your functions before going live and then, and then switching from uh, staging to production, you can do that. Uh, if you want to configure logging, if you want to do, uh, what, what other example? Uh, configure uh, environment variables that you want to inject uh, in your code uh, from the settings you can, and so on and so on. Okay, so uh, this is cool. Uh, serverless uh, is very useful. Uh, other function is cool, but to do what? For example, uh, every 15 minutes, you want to find data in a database, clean that because you have some uh, human uh, as user uh, in your application and they do mistake. Uh, and then you have a clean, a clean table uh, at the end. If you want uh, to, do, uh, to do something every time you have a new file uploaded to a blob storage, so let's say to file storage, uh, for example, transform a CSV to, uh, to, uh, to data uh, stored in a database, you can do that, or you can uh, generate a graph every time you have a new file. If you want to, to do um, asynchronous stuff in your application, for example, generating PDF, uh, you, can, uh, you can have, uh, this is not <laughs> exactly this example, but uh, this is the one uh, you can adapt from previous talk. Uh, you can have a queue with uh, a message telling that this user wants to generate this PDF, and then having your Azure function running the code with one of the library we described earlier. earlier. Uh, at the end, at the output, you can push the new file, the PDF file, to an FTP server, for example. Or you can build a web page uh, with one part of the web page uh, being asynchronous because you need to call an external system or do uh, complex stuff before displaying the complete uh, page to the user. Two other examples. Uh, you have a mobile application. You're doing some stuff uh, with the camera. 
Uh, for example, let's say you, you're taking a video, your users are taking videos, and you want to do some background processing to pre-process the data, adding a watermark or, or whatever. You can, uh, you can do that in Azure Function. Every time you have a new video uploaded by the application, you do whatever you want, and then, for example, you produce thumbnails of uh, the videos or, or of the picture you just uploaded. If you're building a boat, you don't know. When you're building a boat, uh, you don't know how many users are going to use the boat. And you, you don't know how many questions th they, they will ask to the boat. So having a system like Azure Function or uh, any other serverless uh, service is very useful because it will scale if the, your user are going to send uh, one message per minute or 100 message per second, it will scale uh, whatever they are doing. So let's say that uh, a user send a message to the boat, then you're using obviously Cortana analytics to, to handle all the stuff uh, needed for your boat to be intelligent. And then uh, you, you send the results through other function to, to your user. The last example is a real one. Uh, this is an example from uh, Costa Farms. As you may recognize, this is a farm. Uh, they are growing flowers, uh, and they do that at scale. Uh, so they are, I think it's something like uh, one billion every month, one billion flowers. And they, they have to, to be very proactive to detect any issues uh, with their flowers. So one, uh, one way to, to detect a problem is to measure the, the pH of the water, so the pH, the, the acidity, the acidity of the water, uh, before going through the flowers and after. If they have a, a big difference between the two, I don't, I don't know exactly the rules, but you see my point. If you have a difference between the pH before and after, they have to send someone to check if something is happening. So to do that, they have built this system where they have uh, a probe a pH probe, a sensor, which is uh, doing uh, all the stuff needed to calculate the pH of the water. It sends all the message uh, to Azure through IoT Hub, uh, which is a bi-directional uh, system uh, in the IoT world. Then IoT Hub is sending all the messages to Stream Analytics, where a small calculation is done. They calculate the difference between the pH before and after. Uh, for, all the, for all the data, they send it to a database in order to do some graphics, uh, to, to display statistics, and so on. But Stream Analytics is able as well to uh, do something else if they detect something uh, in, the, in the pH. So if, uh, if, the, if there is a difference before and after, they send an event to a queue. And then Azure Function on the top right is configured to have uh, the queue as the trigger. It will read the, the queue every time there is a new message, and it will send as an output uh, the data as uh, a message, a notification to a real person to go and to check the flower. Okay, does that make sense? So the trigger is event hub, a queue. Uh, there is no input uh, because event hub is enough, and there is one output which is uh, Twilio, the SMS system. Actually, I have five minutes left, but I, I won't need them. Uh, I just wanted to, uh, to give you some uh, documentations and some resources you can uh, look if you want to know more. And once again, this is my Twitter account. We have a, we have a challenge in my team, so uh, the more followers I have, the better. So don't hesitate to, uh, to ping me on Twitter if you have any questions. We have still some time left. Thank you.